It was a wonderful meal, but we hope for a spiritual meal the same way that God will bless us. I hope you have been blessed with the stories and the encouragement from God's Word. Uh, it's always a privilege to share what God has done and, and also very humbling because um, we realize that we are so imperfect and weak as human beings and God uses you to be an example and encouragement to others and you realize if only people knew how human we are, how easy it is to lose the patience, how easy it, it is to, to, become, to become discouraged, we would say, why are you using me, Lord? Find somebody better. <laughs> but God uses anybody who's willing. So if you feel inadequate, if you feel like you're not able or you don't think you're the right person, think again. God is willing to use anybody who is willing to place themselves in God's hands. We're the first ones to say we are the most disqualified to do this work, but God has chosen us to do it because we allowed him to, and he can use you the same way. And so don't, don't be discouraged. If you think you're not the right one, just surrender to God and let God make the decision what he wants you to do. I invite you to uh, bow your heads with me before we begin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, after a beautiful physical meal, a lunch, we ask you now to accompany us one more time uh, as, we, as we discuss further principles and tell, give further testimonies of your great faithfulness, your goodness, and your love. Be with us now as we present these things, and please prove an encouragement to us. Encourage us to be part of your work, to trust you more, to know with a certainty that you are coming very soon, and to do everything we can to help others be ready for your soon coming. We thank you for Light Channel Denmark. We thank you for Brother Michael and the family and his team and his children and each of the team members that work with Light Channel. We know it is doing a great work. And we, knew that we know that you are multiplying the impact that it has for thousands of people. We just pray that you will make our lives also multiplied as a blessing. Be with us now and give us a blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to show you some pictures since we now have a little bit more light. Let me, uh, I'm not sure. You see, that wasn't the, this is the first one here. Uh, last night, if you were here, I told you that uh, we lived in Bolivia. And we live in a small house in Bolivia. Um, we moved there after I left the Union and Venezuela, after all the Americans had to leave the country because of the political situation. We moved to Bolivia. We started broadcasting. We had already been, begun broadcasting there. And so my wife told you this morning, I think it was this morning when you told how we built it, uh, we only had $300. And uh, we poured the cement, dug the holes, and we thought that's all we can go. We don't know where to continue. But God provided the resources to build this little two-bedroom house. And that's, that's one of my favorite places on earth. Whenever I go back, I run to the backyard to see how the trees are doing how the plants that I plant. I, the older I get, the more I like doing agriculture. The other day I was watching the lemon tree put out all the lemons and I go, Lord, this is so much fun. And he said, now you know how I feel when my people have fruit. Huh? God gives us many benefits, resources, education, opportunities, talents, and he wants his people to have fruit, doesn't he? So that, that's what he wants. Okay. Uh, North of Bolivia, as we travel north, this is, uh, uh, in Portuguese, it's the, it's the base of the angels. It's, why is it called the angel base? It's called the angel base because, because that's what our airplanes are called. They're called angels. And it's, this is where the airplanes will be based because they will be landing in the water. They're seaplanes, and they will be landing in the water, and, and they'll be based at this air base near Manaus in Brazil. Uh, it has a two-story building there. Um, I, I wanted to show some other pictures, but they didn't get in here, evidently. Um, maybe I'll show some more this afternoon. But it has a kitchen, a rather large kitchen. It has uh, trees, fruit trees in the back and other things. And uh, it was built by a Swiss man and his Brazilian wife. And during the World Cup, some of the, four years ago, some of the football players came and stayed here. But we bought it from him, 
and it, it's now being turned into, it used to be called, it had a name like, it had a name of a dragon. And I took the name down and I said, now the angels are going to live here. <laughs> so, uh, we have a little air bay, a little medical launch. I'm sorry the picture is small because it was sent over Facebook. I couldn't find uh, uh, a bigger picture of it. The original is on one of my hard drives. But that is our little medical launch. Uh, we use it to go back up and down the river, up and down the rivers, visit the neighbors, uh, transport patients, and to take care of them. Eventually, we would like to have a bigger one, but that'll cost a little bit more money. And uh, once we have a bigger one, then we can actually have a, a, a clinic on, on board. This is just to transport people. Uh, but it has a little kitchenette in the back, a little bathroom, and so you can be traveling for days if you need to on the Amazon River for there. Uh, when you reach Venezuela, remember, I mentioned to you that we stayed in a little, in three little thatch roof houses. That's our house in Venezuela. We stayed there seven years. Um, this is our bedroom here. Uh, the other bedroom was our boys, and this is our kitchen right there. And you can see that it's a, it's a very nice little place. We love sleeping in it. It's uh, cool. It's up higher in the mountains, and the wind blows right through it. And when it rains, it, the rain blows right through it, too. <laughs> Uh, it doesn't. It, uh, these walls are just little bamboo sticks, and so uh, there's nothing between them. So the the wind and the rain blows through too sometimes, but we sleep right through it. Um, so this is, we we like little houses. This is our little house in Guyana. Can you see it? Okay, not very well, huh? It's a little dark. Maybe tonight we can look at some other ones. Uh, but that's that little house is a little one bedroom on the bottom for the kitchen, and one bedroom, I mean, one room on the bottom and one room on top for our bedroom. And uh, I just came through there, and they're making the last final adjustments where the windows are going to go, the bathroom, they're putting in the toilet. And when we, when we moved to Guyana, because our chief pilot, our chief pilot, after 11 years, has left. So my wife and I moved back to Guyana, where we started 22 years ago, picked up the administration again. And so we're living part of the year in Guyana and part of the year in Bolivia. And uh, this is where we're going to live. Uh, it's the, right in front of the house, right here, is the runway. So you land right in front of the house and park the airplane and go, go home to sleep. <laughs> it, uh, it's not the size of where you live. It's where you live. That's the most important. But sometimes, this is where we live, under the airplane. <laughs> sometimes we have to sleep under the wing of the airplane because we're on the road. And when we landed here, the lady said in the hangar, I have an extra bed for you, but there's mosquitoes. So we just put the bed under the wing. We tied a mosquito net, and that's in the morning. She, she wanted to take a picture of us. So this is where we spent the night, that night under the wing of the airplane. Uh, sometimes we sleep under the wing of the airplane like that. This is where we landed in Miami in a little airport, and we got there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and now we have to sleep. So we just stretch a little blanket out under the wing of the airplane, and uh, we just sleep under the wing. If, if it sprinkles a little bit, at least it doesn't go on your head. Your feet might get wet, but, but the, it's only a light, light sprinkle. It's not too badly, but you don't want it on your face. So when you sleep under the wing of the airplane, you have a little roof over your head. But we've had some really strong rains, and we've had to quickly grab all our things and put it inside the airplane and jump inside, and it gets very hot. But I think that's all I have for right now. Oh, no, there's one more. Uh, we were in Romania some years ago, and we went to the top of the mountain in Romania, and uh, there was a shepherd up there. And the shepherd said, we would like for you and Aunt Becky to move up here to the top of the mountain. We will give you a place to stay. I said, thank you very much, but we can't, st we can't live here. We ha we're just visiting. Please come and live up here. And then he gave me his horse, and it was kind of cold, and he put on his sheepskin jacket. And then one of the students that was with us said something interesting. Uncle David, do you remember that, that uh, false shepherds are going to be wolves are coming among the sheep and they're dressed, dressed in sheepskins? <laughs> so then we realized that the sheep never wear sheepskin except their own. It's the wolves who put on sheepskins. And who are the ones who do that? The pastors. So if you're a pastor, it's the, it's the, you know, we say in English, we say shepherds, right? 
In Spanish, we say pastores. So the, the shepherds and pastors is the same word. I don't know if, if other languages are the same, but it's the pastores that wear the shepherd skin, because, I, mean, because, I mean the sheep skin, because the, the shepherds are the one shepherding the sheep. And so they use the, shep, the sheep skin to stay warm. So then he said, the false shepherds wear sheepskin. So be very careful to be a good shepherd. And I thought that's a good lesson to learn. If you have a responsibility to care for the sheep, be sure to always be a good shepherd. Don't be a wolf in sheep's clothing, like Jesus said. So that was, that was interesting. Well, that's all I have for right now. We can, we can turn it off. Uh, I'm not sure if you can turn it off from here or not. Okay. So... Maybe we can, can we just shut this off here? Or right there. Okay. Anyway, I, I hope you enjoyed a few pictures. There's a lot more, but I, I'll show you some more this afternoon. Right now it's kind of hard with the light. Um, we, are, we are grateful for what God um, is doing for us this weekend and to encourage us. I know that because of this weekend, the work will go forward in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. We were talking about a project for Armenia. That was exciting. We were talking about a project for uh, Tanzania, too. Uh, Kenya, I'm sorry, for Kenya, for Africa. And um, I know that the work in he here in Denmark, in Scandinavia in general, in Europe, and in other parts of the world will be blessed because of the weekend we spent here together. I pray it will be an encouragement for you and your family. And so, as we open God's Word again, and as we share some more stories, I want to, uh, I want to uh, invite you to open your Bible to Matthew 25. We have one more parable that we're going to use as a, as a guide here. Rem let's review quickly. The first parable of Matthew 25 is the uh, ten virgins. We learned that the ten virgins represent the church, that while there's a delay in Jesus' coming, the tendency is for the church to, to sleep. But there's going to be a wake-up call. And once the church hears that event, wake-up call, they are going to wake up, and all of them are going to get, try to get ready for Jesus' coming. Everybody will suddenly be interested in Jesus' coming. Unfortunately, we learned it's too late to get ready at that time. Getting ready is a something we should do now. Having a relationship with God uh -huh. is now. Having oil in your lamp is now. We also learned this, this afternoon, uh, at noon, at the noon hour, we learned that getting oil in your lamp is using your talents, your skills to save souls. If, you are, if your mission is to seek and to save that which was lost, you're a missionary. You're sharing in the mission of Jesus Christ. And that means your lifetime dedicated to serving God. Now we're going to go to the third. How can I use my talents and skills? Many people say, well, what can I do? Uh, I'm just a housewife. I'm just a carpenter. I'm just a, a farmer. I'm just a church member. What can I do? Every single person has a circle of influence. And what you do with your time and your money, it makes all the difference. Did you know that God specializes in using people that are weak? Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. So when you are weak, you may be stronger than a strong person. Because when you recognize your weakness, you are more willing to depend on God. And those who depend on God have greater strength than those that have great strength on their own. So we need to realize how weak we are. We need to realize that indeed um, we need to learn how to depend on God. Okay, we'll start reading on verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in all His glory and His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all the nations, and He shall separate one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set his sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. I believe almost every Christian church believes there's going to be a final judgment. 
I believe everybody believes that. They just don't understand what the judgment is about, and they don't understand how the judgment is going to take place. But there has to be a judgment. There has to be a judgment before Jesus comes. Because we as Adventists, we know that we are living in the judgment. When did that judgment begin, the investigative judgment? 1844, at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. Now, is that, when, is that when God started judging the people that were alive, or did he start judging those that were dead? The dead. He started with Adam and Eve, and he has to judge all the way through history. That's a lot of work, isn't it? A lot of work. But before Jesus comes, it has to go to the judgment of the living. Do you agree? You understand what I mean by judgment of the living. Everybody who's alive on earth has to go through the judgment. Because Jesus, when he comes, he's not coming to separate the sheep from the goats. That process is happening before he comes. Of course, there's a separation process physically. I mean, some go with him and some don't. But the decision has to be made before he comes. When he comes, he's not coming to decide. The decision has already been taken. Everybody, uh, is that in God's hands or is that decision in your hands? Okay, some say God's. What side you're on? Does God decide what side you're on or does your decision also affect? You decide, but God recognizes your decision. God says, David Gates has chosen to give his life to me and to let and surrender his will to me and he belongs to me. I now recognize his decision, and therefore, if that's my decision, and it remains that way, God will keep my name on the book of life. And everybody who claims to be a child of God, their names, if they ever were converted, their names were written in the book of life. But before Jesus comes, a final decision has to be made if your name is still on the book of life. Imagine even Ellen G. White. She was told, if you are faithful, you and the 144,000 will be here. But if you are faithful, what about Paul? Paul says, I press, I press on daily. He fights the battle daily, lest I be discounted like a runner who's running in a race. Have you ever ran in a race? Most of us, when we were young, ran in races, right? And I remember running in a race, and I was 18 years old, and I looked back to see the guy behind me, and I lost my feet, and I fell down. Well, the guy passed me up, and I just stayed on the ground. I was too tired. But that's because I looked back. You're not supposed to look back. You're supposed to always look forward. And so we press toward the mark, Paul says, of the high calling of Jesus Christ. So we have the, we have the, uh, uh, the calling that God has given us, and if we... And if we uh, if we are obedient to it, then we can be written in the book of life. Okay, it says here, he will separate those that are the nations before him as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And uh, he will say to the sheep on his right, uh, he will say to them that on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came unto me. But the righteous, they don't know what to think. The righteous themselves, they don't remember seeing Jesus. Uh, they don't remember seeing Jesus in that, in that condition. So they said, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? And, um, and so they asked Jesus that. And what was the answer? In as much... As ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. So this is how we get, this is how we use our talents. We take care of those that are hungry. We take care of those that are thirsty. We dress those that need dress. We care for those that are weak. And when you do it to the weak, you do it to Jesus. Uh, sometimes it can be pretty hard. Sometimes it can be pretty hard to help somebody because Many times they, they don't appreciate it. Or many times they waste what you give them. I was walking in Trinidad, 
And the man came to me and he said, I'm very hungry. Can you give me something to eat? And I said, yes. So I, get, I took out my lunch and I gave him my sandwich. And when I gave him my sandwich, I saw him take one bite and he threw it in the... And that was my favorite sandwich. My wife made it for me and I was quite hungry and I was willing to share my sandwich. But what I found was, what I found out was that um, unfortunately, he didn't like, he wanted a chicken sandwich or a beef sandwich or something, and he didn't like my sandwich. But I shared, and he threw it away. So sometimes you repent. Sometimes you say, I wish I hadn't helped somebody. I'm not going to help them anymore. But the truth is, Jesus is very patient with us. huh? How many times has God forgiven you? How many times have you done something and said, Lord, I'm sorry, I, I messed up again? Hmm? So, so we should still keep trying, but we still get a little bit more careful because we learn our lessons. And after people throw our sandwiches enough times, you don't want to give them a sandwich anymore. But, but I, I believe that Jesus' example is to be very patient with us, and he, he wants us to also be patient with others. Uh, there's many, many people that I know that have wasted their lives, given their heart to the Lord, and now God is using them in mighty ways. I knew a drug addict in Australia. He couldn't even carry a conversation. You'd ask him, he could hardly remember his name. But when he started, when he gave his heart to the Lord, he started preaching everywhere. He is very good. God restored his mind. And he was able to he was able to preach and memorize scripture and quote scripture. He could not even do that before. But God is so gracious to us that he forgives us and he heals us. So we're, we're um, so thankful that, that God does that for us. Um, just, just some stories about how to help people. Um, surround, around you, uh, there are always people in need. I was having a week of prayer in, in Caracas in Venezuela. And, um, and it's a big church, one of the biggest churches in Caracas. And, and they said, Pastor D David, when you're in the jungles, you're helping the people that don't have, any, they don't have any, any transportation. They don't have anything at all. But here in the city, the people have medical care. That was years ago when, when Venezuela was stable. People have medical care. They have food. What can we do for them? And I said, um, one of the hardest things that poor people um, have a hard time getting is justice. Do we have any lawyers? Do we have any lawyers in our church? Oh, yes, we have three lawyers. Well, what would happen if we offered free legal advice? Can we offer free legal advice to poor people? Many times they don't know what to do. They can't afford a lawyer. But people take their houses, they throw them on the streets, they need somebody to represent them. Why don't you offer some free uh, legal services? So they started doing that, and they found there was a lot of people in Caracas that were very grateful to have a free lawyer. Just talk to them, explain your problem, and then get some free advice. So you see, it doesn't have to be always food. It doesn't have to be always clothing. It can be legal work. What about single mothers, single parents? Well. I know that in Denmark, maybe there's more health care and medical care and, and government services than maybe most some countries, uh, especially some poorer countries. But there's people, even the rich people, they have mental stress. Did you know that rich people commit a lot of suicide? The richest woman in the world was uh, Christina Onassis. Her father was one of the richest men in the world, and when he died, he left everything to his daughter. She had airplanes, she had ships, she had islands. She, they, 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 there was no way that she could spend all her money all her life. No matter how much she spent, she could never spend it all. She came to visit Peru when, when I was working in Peru. And then she decided to go to Argentina. And in Argentina, she got depressed and she committed suicide. The richest woman in the world took her own life 
because she was depressed. Now, I wish she could have had some hope. I wish somebody could have reached her before it was too late. But you see, money has nothing to do with whether there's, a, there's depression in this country. There's people that are depressed. And there's pills that you can buy. And the doctors will give you pills. But they need Jesus Christ. And the only way they can do that is to be exposed to his love. It's a wonderful thing when you're depressed. How many of you have ever gone through depression at some time in your life? Okay, many of us have. I've been through it several times, but very short periods, because I'm not normally a person that gets depressed. But when I got depressed one time, I was away from home. I was working on my airplane. I had been gone from home almost two months. It looked like I was going to be gone another two months. And I, I just, it was year end, and uh, the, everything closes for New Year and Christmas. And I could see that I was going to be gone another month. And I just, and I was in the, I was in the cold in winter time working on the engine. And I wanted to get the airplane ready to go down to Guyana. And, and, and a darkness crept over me. And I just wished I could go into the corner, crawl up into a ball, and die. That's what depression does to you. Depression is like, I don't want to live any longer. And I said, this is not normal. This is not me. Something is happening to me. Dear Lord, I believe the enemy wants to discourage me, but it's, I just don't see any light. Please, if this discouragement is not from you, if it's not normal, if it's the enemy, just take it away, please. And in less than one minute, I was tightening them. <whistles> hey, it's gone. I can see the light. No more darkness. And I realized God just took it away from me just like that. I said, oh, Lord, thank you. Now that I'm feeling normal again, what can I do? And I, and I said, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish this engine installation. I'm going to fly it. Everything looks good. I'm going to drop it off at the paint shop. I'm going to leave it there over, over Christmas and New Year. I'll let the painter deal with the airplane. And I'm going to catch a bus. And I'm going to fly tonight. I'm going to go tonight by bus to Miami. Then from Miami, I'm going to catch the last flight uh, of the year into Guyana. Then I will call the company and say, when you make your last flight into the jungle, I want to save me a seat. I want to go in to see my family, and I'll be there for the, by the year end. So, and as I was going to the bus station, I said, oh, my family is going to want something nice. So why don't I buy some bread? Buy some nice food for Christmas uh, season, and let's 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 see if I can get some of this. And I bought two suitcases. I, I bought some cheap suitcases, like five dollars a piece, and I just filled them up with food. And I went down, got on the airline. I made the last flight in. I jumped on a small airplane and I flew into the 200 miles into the jungles. That was before our little airplane had begun to function. You see, I was getting it ready, and so my wife was so sorry, she was also feeling a little low. My husband was been gone so long, and now he's going to be gone another couple of weeks. There will be no more airplanes coming in. I'll send him a little letter, and I'll say, I'm so sorry, sweetie pie, that you can't be here for us with us. And she was standing on the runway waiting for the airplane to come in, and, and she was going to give the letter to the pilot so the pilot could take it to town and they could mail it. And she was sitting there, and the lady that was next to my wife said, Sister Becky, I think I saw your husband looking out through the window of the airplane. Like, I still don't know how could she see that. <laughs> We're way up there flying. How could she know that was me looking through the window? Anyway, I didn't in any I don't I still don't understand that. But and Becky said, No, no, he's not here. No, it can't be him. But I, that was me. And when I got out of the airplane, she was so happy, and I was so happy to be there. And and uh, the children di didn't come up. They were at the house. So I told, I told her, take the two suitcases, walk on down to the house, and when the children see the suitcases, they say, what are you bringing? Just tell them, Daddy sent two suitcases so we can have a special year-end uh, time together. And then when, while you're looking at the suitcases, I'm going to walk in from behind the house. So I walked in a different path. She walked down. Mommy, Mommy, what did you bring? What did you bring? Daddy sent two suitcases. Well, open them up, open them up. We want to see what's in it. 
Wow, bread, some cookies. Oh, my, there's this vegetable and that. Oh, my, some cranberry sauce. Oh, look at that. All these things they were opening up. There were cans of food and other things. I walked in from the back door, and I was standing in the back, and they didn't even know I was in the house. And when they looked up, they saw me standing in the back. It was the most wonderful two weeks, three weeks we've had in our whole entire life. We'll never forget it. And it came right after a great darkness. And I realized that the devil is always trying to discourage us. He's always trying to make us see the worst. And, to, and he wants us to distrust God and say, Lord, I don't know why you allow this to happen. This is horrible. I don't know if you really love me. You wouldn't let the, you know, to lose confidence in God. What we need to do is realize the devil is always trying to discourage us. What we need to do is pray to God, ask him to clear the darkness, and start thanking God for all the good things he has done for us. Did you know that when you have a thankful spirit, the darkness can't stay? Now, there's another thing you can do for darkness. Did you remember seeing the beautiful videos we had here during lunchtime? Did you see some of those beautiful videos? That beautiful music with God's word, it's impossible to be depressed long if you fill your mind with those beautiful, that beautiful promises in God and the beautiful music. So if you suffer from a little bit of depression, try thanking God for all of your blessings and listening to beautiful music that, that God will raise your heart in praise to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord. You start thinking, singing songs. And if you start singing songs like that, you will be very, very, it won't be long and you will, and you will be, uh, the darkness will leave you. Was there a time that Jesus had darkness? When was that? In Gethsemane. Oh, that must have been a terrible darkness because he was going to have to leave his father possibly for eternity. We could never, never understand that kind of love. We can never understand the kind of love that would separate God the Father from God the Son in order to save mankind. We've only been married about 39 years, and God the Father and God the Son were together from eternity. And you try separating, separating God the Father from the Son that have been together for eternity, we can't even imagine how painful that is. Not even any idea. And yet they were willing to do that in order for you and I, for you and me, to be in heaven. Isn't that wonderful love? That is so much to be grateful for. Um, when I was in India, when I was in India, I went to, uh, I was invited to go to India the first time by an evangelical pastor. And the evangelical pastor called me and he said, we want you to come visit us in India. And I said, well, I, I don't have time for another two or three months, but I will be in Australia, and I can probably come across from Australia. And he said, please. So I, I left Australia. I preached in a Romanian church in Australia, and I did not know that when I was shaking hands, a little Australian, la a little Romanian lady came and she stuck an envelope in my pocket. Right here. I didn't know that. I said goodbye. I left the next day for a quick trip to, to India. I got to India and uh, I stayed at the pastor's house. And the pastor said, we know you're an Adventist pastor. Yes. Why would you accept an appointment from an evangelical pastor. I said, because it's an opportunity to share with you what God has done. And he said, there's an Adventist church next door. Do you want to talk to the Adventist pastor? I said, sure. So the Adventist pastor came over and he said, you're an Adventist pastor? Yes. Why, why didn't you come to our church? Why did you go to the other church? I said, you didn't invite me. They invited me. And, and who are you again? I pulled out my card and I said, I'm, I work with communication in ADRA for the Venezuelan Union. He looked at the card. It was even harder for him to understand 
that a union department director would come all the way to India to work with an evangelical church. I said, but I'm willing to preach in your church too. I just, you didn't invite me. So I came where you and whoever invited me. He said, I'll be there. I'll come to the meetings. 250 evangelical pastors came to the meeting. And we had, we had about three days together. And I shared with him many of the things that we believe like, like Jesus soon coming, uh, the state of the dead, uh, spiritualism, uh, the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, many of these things I shared with them. And they were very receptive, very, very nice people, very ch truly children of God. And then that night I went to sleep, and the next day we were going to go look at a, we were going to a leper colony. Now, there used to be lepers all around India, but the government made them get off the streets and put them into lep put them into colonies by themselves. And then the government denied there was any leprosy in the country. Basically left them there to die. They weren't allowed in town anymore. But the next morning I woke up at six o'clock in the morning. There was a knock on my door and, and the pastor said, uh, excuse me, Pastor David, there are four young ladies outside that want to talk to you. I said, just a minute. I put on my suit. I dressed up, combed my hair, went outside, and there was four young ladies and their mothers, about 10 to 12 years old. And they said, uh, we have a request. We are Christians, but our fathers are not Christian. And they sell us to the heathen temples every week. And we have to dance, we have to dance naked in the temples. We are abused. Then the police come and they take us to the police station and they abuse us there. For how much money? About two to three dollars a week. And Uncle David, we don't want to do that anymore. But we have to eat. Is there any way you can help us? And I said, how can I help you? Well, one girl said, I would like to have uh, some pressure cookers that I can cook food in and I can sell the food. Another said, I would like to have a tire repair shop for, repair shop for motorcycles. And then we can repair tires on the street and we can make a little money. Another girl said, I want to have a shopping cart where I can push with big wheels on it, where I can put fruit on it, and I can go through the street and I can sell fruit, and I can make a couple of dollars a day, and that will be enough so that our fathers will not sell us. How much will that, all of it cost? The pastor added it up and he said, about 600 US dollars. I didn't have 600 US dollars. I said, I'm not quite sure how to help you. Oh, but if it was my daughter being sold on the street, I would do everything I could. But I didn't have the money, and I was, I went like this, and I said, what, 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 what is this? There was an envelope in my pocket. And I pulled it out, and it said in Romanian, Brother David, use this money any way you need to. I didn't know I had a donation in my pocket. I opened it up. Guess how much money was inside? $600. I said, God has answered your prayer. I didn't even know I had $600. But God stuck it in my pocket, and here is $600. They immediately fell on their knees like to thank me. I said, no, 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 don't thank me. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Don't kneel down before me. It wasn't my money. It was God you need to kneel down before. Thank God. It's his money. Well, they were evangelical girls, so they started going. And I'm an Adventist, and I don't hardly do that very much, and I was going, well. <laughs> and, but, but they were saying, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. They were so happy. And they sent me the pictures, and one girl had her repair, tire repair kit. Another girl had her pressure cookers. Another girl had her, uh, her little cart selling, you know, those kind of things. All four girls were able to make a small living, and they were not sold again. It's hard for us to understand what some people have to go through in order just to survive. But later on in the day, 
later on in the day we went to uh, we went to the leper colony. Now, when you go to the leper colony, there's a lot of people that don't have fingers, they don't have ears, they don't have noses because the leprosy has eaten up all the soft tissue, and uh, they're kind of bony. And it's a very painful situation to see so many people with ulcers and fingers missing and toes missing and, and dragging their feet along, you know, like and dragging themselves. It's, it's a very sad, le leprosy is a very, very terrible disease, even in Jesus' time too. Well, I got my camera out and I was taking pictures and suddenly one of the men there started arguing. I didn't understand the language. But he was arguing with the other pastor. And he said, no pictures, no pictures, no pictures, no, no, no. All you do is take pictures and you go and raise money and you never help us. You're just abusing us. You're just coming to collect the pictures of us. And, and then you're going to go raise money, but you'll never help us. I said, no, no problem, no problem. I put the camera away and locked the car. No. I didn't come to get pictures. I... I thought I would take some pictures so that I could help. But if, if you prefer not to, I won't take any pictures. But the man was angry, and he was still, they were over there arguing and arguing. And while they were over there arguing, I saw a group of people just looking at me. They didn't know what to think. I walked over to them, and then I remembered, you know, you know Jesus always used to touch the lepers? Huh? Didn't he? You weren't supposed to touch the lepers. But Jesus always touched the lepers. He would put his hands on them. Lord, if you wilt, you can make me whole. And Jesus said, I will, and touched them. So I remembered that Jesus always used to touch lepers. So I said, well, I need to touch the lepers then. So I went and I shook somebody's little stub. I just shook his hand. He didn't have a hand, it was like this. And then another person had no ears, but I, I, I held him. Another lady, I gave her a kiss on both cheeks. I gave a hug to a man that had no nose and no ears. Part of his eyes were eaten away, part of his eyelids. Very ugly situation. But I gave them hugs and kisses. And as I was doing that, suddenly the arguing stopped. They looked up and they saw me over there hugging and kissing people. Immediately, there was no more arguing left. Immediately, they stopped there. And then, you know what the people said? The people said, can we get a picture together? <laughs> so I said, sure, you want a picture together? Yes, yes, we want a picture with you. If you're willing to hug and to kiss us, we definitely want a picture with you. So we stood together. The pastor got the camera out. Took a lot of, take a picture with me, take a picture with me. Everybody wanted their picture taken. No more arguments. All because you're willing to touch a leper. Well, what we did for them, they said one of the biggest needs they had was water. The water would come in only two hours every day. They had a pipe. And everybody would line up. And for two hours, they would fill a bucket. Then they would go away. Somebody else would fill a bucket. Then they would fill a bucket. And every family would get about one bucket of water per day, and that was all. But you know that the water would spill on the ground sometimes, because if you change the bucket, there would be another person coming up, carrying the bucket, and the water would spill on the ground. So I said, what you need to do is to have a tank, and all the water will go into the tank, so nothing is wasted, and then you can get water out of the tank. They said, yes. That way we can save all the water. So what we did is we built a tank for them. So the water would come two hours a day. It would pour into the tank. And then they could open and close and take the water out. But none of it would be wasted. So that was the first thing we did. The second thing they wanted was a school. So we opened a secondary school for them. And we had an American family that went down and worked for about three or four years. But since they left, I've never found anybody else to go back. So we just left them to school, and I don't know today if it's operating, but we did what we could. And I still remember those people, and I'm sure many of them have died, but if you really think of how many places there are in the world that need help. 
I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. This is what Jesus is looking for today. He's looking for somebody that is willing to share his love. Is that you? Is God calling you to share his love? Young people, middle-aged people, families, entire families can go. Retired people can go. In fact, sometimes retired people have more freedom than even anybody else because they have a small income and they can live cheaply in many parts of the world. We, we had a little lady came from Michigan. She was from Ecuador. She lived in Michigan in the U.S. And she came down and she just became the grandmother to all the volunteers. She didn't do anything in particular. She just was a grandmother. She would say, young people, I think it's time to go out for pizza. And the young people would go. And she would take them out and pay for all the pizza. They would come back and go, grandmother, thank you very much. You see, and she just loved them. And the young people just felt like so appreciated. And she would buy them nice food and buy them nice this. And you need a shirt. You need another shirt. Here's a shirt for you. Thank you, grandmother. Thank you very much. You, you can understand, right? Just sharing love. That's all she did. And now she's gotten older and she had to go back. She had a little accident and she had to move back to the U.S. But nobody will forget what a wonderful grandmother she was to all the volunteers. So there's room for everybody. If you're young, middle-aged, or older, there is room for you on the front lines. Of course, we know that not everybody can go to the front lines. Some of us have to remain here. But I just want you to know that there is work to do for you. You understand. So if you ask God, he will show you where you are right now. He will show you what he wants you to do. How to share your love. Today with, today with media, young people today can use the YouTube to do a lot of things. You can translate if you know other languages. You can translate videos and put them on your YouTube channel. And that reaches thousands of people across the planet. If you don't know how to do media, then you can do other things. But if you work together with young people, if you have a skill, they can record it and they can put it on. If you have messages, a testimony, maybe you have a story that somebody needs to hear. You can record it and put it on the internet and people can hear it over and over and over and over again. And thousands of people can be encouraged about what God did for you. So I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, that was the third parable and a very important one. First of all, I need oil in my lamp. Secondly, how do I get oil? By using my resources, time, influence, professions to search for and to seek for and save that which was lost. How do I do that? By helping them with their basic needs. Maybe they just need a friend. Maybe they just need some prayer. Do you know how encouraging it is for somebody to pray for you when you're struggling with a painful situation? It's a wonderful thing that somebody said, let me pray for you. Let me just pray for you and ask God's blessing. Thank you. It's a wonderful thing. So we have prayer ministry. We have, we have ministry for feeding the hungry, for giving clothes to the needy. And even, do you think, do you think in Denmark there are people who have needs? Um, they're all around you. Some of them have money, but they are very depressed. Some of them don't have money. Sometimes they have family problems. Sometimes they don't know how to deal with the children. Sometimes their husband is leaving or their wife is leaving and they're by themselves and they just don't know what to do. But you do. You know Jesus Christ and you can share. So as we, as we close this, this session, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me as we ask God to somehow show us what is will for us, how we can help other people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you have given us an opportunity to work with you, to seek and to save that which was lost, to help to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to give clothing to those that need it, to visit those that need help, to visit those in prison, those that are widows, to help those that are wrestling with, with darkness and wrestling with uh, financial issues and family issues. Lord, show us our work. 
and give us a willing spirit. But we want to be used by you. Please, Lord, show us our work. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Please put your love in our hearts so that we can feel what we need to do, that we can feel the love, so that we can share the love. Please do this for us, Lord, because we're naturally not loving. We are naturally not unselfish. We are naturally not giving people, but we want to be. So we ask you to live in our hearts and do that for us today, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.